Um, our next speaker is uh, Dave Nichols, um, a professor of medicinal chemistry and pharmacology in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Purdue, um, and also co-founder of Hefter uh, Institute, where he serves as director of, of preclinical research. Um, Dave has published more than 200 research articles. You should see his CV. You know, a day or so ago, he sent me, he said, I don't know if you need this for your, for, to introduce me. And he sent me the CV, so I opened it up. It's 47 pages. Dave, where are you? I mean, incredible. Uh, I, I, it, 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 there, were, there were a list of papers, and it went on for six pages, like 200, page, 200 papers. And then there was other stuff, you know, another six pages. I, I, uh, it was not the volume of it, honestly, although the volume was a little intimidating, but the incredible quality of his scholarship and his reputation and his work over the years, and the fact that we have a man of such um, gravitas, of such seriousness of purpose in the scientific community, focusing his efforts, his wholehearted and, and, uh, and, and administratively sophisticated professorial efforts at uh, moving forward what we're all talking about here. Just to finish off his, his bio, however, um, uh, uh, 200 research articles on various aspects of medicinal chemistry and neuropharmacology. His laboratory has published numerous studies elucidating details both of the mechanism of action of MDMA and of the biochemical events uh, related to the neurotoxic effects seen in animals following administration. Dr. Nichols coined the name entactogen to describe the unique pharmacological uh, psychopharmacological effects of MDMA and related compounds. So I'll turn you over to Dave to tell us about the uh, history of this work over the last few decades. on a Mac. I may be living in an alternate reality <clears throat> or a parallel universe. Bottom left. Bottom left, he said. Thank you. I didn't think a Mac was supposed to have these problems. Renaissance, what does it take for Renaissance to occur? The Renaissance in Europe was certainly more profound than any Renaissance we see in psychedelic research, but in the context of the way things used to be, Maybe there is a sort of renaissance. So if there is, <clears throat> did it just happen? A renaissance is defined as a renewal of life, vigor, interest, rebirth, or revival. Now since the summer of love and Haight-Ashbury and all that, there has been a significant subculture in this country and around the world that has always been uh, advocating and using psychedelics. At least that's my observation. So. 
I can't say that there's been a renaissance in those circles. So I thought, is there a renaissance in any other circle? Well, I am a mainstream scientist at a Midwestern university, and I travel in different circles probably than most of you. When I look at the field where I work in, among academics and uh, the public, a mainstream press, there are things happening. I think nobody can deny that. So if we define a renaissance as a re sort of resurgence of interest among the public and not necessarily among the subculture, then how would we define that and what would contribute to it? So I just sort of sat and thought about, from my perspective as an academic scientist, sort of mainstream reductionist, and by the way, many people in the subculture have told me that there's no possible way for a reductionist scientist to study psychedelics. Uh, maybe I can convince you that there are a few things I've done that have been useful over the years, despite the fact that I'm a mainstream reductionist scientist most of the time. I was at a meeting with Tim Leary on a panel years ago, and I was saying I was a reductionist scientist, and Tim leaned out and he said, Dave, you're not a reductionist scientist all the time. And I looked at Tim and I said, but nobody's supposed to know that, Tim. So maybe we can make this move to the next slide. <clears throat> you can't really see that, but the first thing that had to occur is a re-education of the public. So what's the real problem with acceptance of psychedelics? The real problem is the media hype that told everybody that if you take LSD, you're going to go crazy and jump out a window or that LSD is going to liquefy your spinal cord. That's another one we've all heard. <clears throat> so the big problem is getting people to accept the fact that psychedelics are worth studying. Now, to me, it's a no-brainer. And people say, well, why do you find psychedelics interesting to study? I said, well, here's a substance where we take an extremely tiny amount, a tenth of a milligram, and people can take it. It diffuses into their brain, it stays there for four hours, and it diffuses back out, and their worldview may be permanently changed as a result of that. How can a substance do that? I mean, it's just a, it's just a chemical substance. It goes in your brain, it comes back out, and you're never the same. That, to me, was a very interesting question. And, of course, all the things that happen while it's in your brain, that's a whole other matter. So it seemed to me like you're touching on a chemistry that's fundamentally related to who we are, as humans and how we define ourselves as, as human species. And what's really puzzling to me is that more scientists aren't interested in this question. But nevertheless, I decided to work in this area. So <clears throat> the basic issue that I've approached it is serotonin is the fundamental mo molecule of consciousness. And I wrote a comprehensive review article in 2004 that sort of explicated everything we knew about how psychedelics worked in the brain. <clears throat> you probably can't see this, but this was a crude wiring diagram of the frontal cortex and how it interacts with uh, all the other parts of the brain to process sensory information. The target for psychedelics is a serotonin receptor called the serotonin 2A receptor. At least that's the principal one, necessary but not necessarily sufficient. And it's really interesting because that receptor is localized in all the really cool places that are involved in sensory processing. It's located on the cortical cells in the frontal cortex where we make executive decisions. And it increases the gain of those cells, it makes them easier to fire so they can do more with less, so to speak. It also affects an area called the thalamus. All the sensory information that comes into our bodies except for taste and smell goes through the thalamus. And the thalamus is sort of a filter that decides which of that information gets sent to the cortex for processing. Serotonin 2A receptors regulate the function of the thalamus. We have very primitive brain areas at the top of the brain stem known as the Raphae nuclei. And again, you can't see these, but uh, the Raphae, the locus ceruleus, and the ventral tegmental area. <clears throat> the Raphae is a very primitive serotonin system that sends serotonin neurons to the whole brain. The psychedelics slow the firing of those cells. The locus ceruleus is an area that's been called a novelty detector, and it normally has burst firing. So if you're sitting and your neighbor drops something next to you on the floor, your locus ceruleus starts